Hey, good morning, Catalyst Church. Welcome. We're excited to join us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning, God. I just pray a blessing over each person here today, God. Would you be with us as we worship you, as we hear from your word. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Come on.
place when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between What remains of me and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever need remind Of how I've been set free There was a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire Standing next 
speaks to me there really another in the water rolling back the sea and should I ever need reminded how good you've been to me I count the joy in every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy in every battle cause I know that's where you'll be Count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Yes, Jesus, we believe that today.
can see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. crazy time. Lord, in our world, God, we, we declare that today. Lord, you are the way maker. God, we rely on that. We rest in it, Jesus. As we sing these words, God, they're more than just words. They're a declaration. God, we believe this. God, we invite you to work in us today. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome everybody to Catalyst Church. We're very excited that you're joining us online today. Wherever you are, I just hope you're having an amazing day. Hey, listen, if you're new with us this morning, I want you to go ahead and grab your phone and text Catalyst to 509-385-0811 because we've got a little gift basket package. I don't know if it's a, in a basket or not, but we've got a gift for you anyway. And uh, we'd love to share it with you and chat with you. So, again, just text Catalyst to 509-385-0811. We'd love to hear from you. I'd also like to thank you all for your tithes and offerings and support during this time. We couldn't do it without that, and we're just really grateful um, for you guys supporting Catalyst and for supporting um, the dream that God has put on all the staff here. And uh, we're just excited to be meeting you wherever you happen to be at today. So thank you so much for joining us. And without Hello, Catalyst Church family. We are Jeff and Christy Geyer, and we'd like to spend just a few moments and relay a portion of our story as it relates to tithing. Two and a half years ago, I left my position as the CEO of a fairly large medical clinic. And since then, I have not worked in that industry or at that level. In fact, my income today is orders of magnitude less than it was when I was a CEO. And I wanna to relay to you that since that time, over the last two and a half years, 
the finances in our household, even though my income has been significantly reduced from where it was before, have been actually better than they were before. We have less debt than we had before. All of our bills are paid. We haven't missed a beat on anything. And we attribute all of that to two things. One, our obedience to God's command for the tithe, but more importantly, to his faithfulness to his word and to us. It's been simply amazing. Yeah, it has. It really has been. And uh, at every step, um, the Lord has uh, continued to bless us even through the COVID season. Uh, Lord didn't skip a beat um, with us. I uh, was able to um, have work when the salon was shut down, uh, so was able to generate some income. And uh, once the salon was reopened, um, God just blessed, um, just over the top blessed me abundantly with my business. It took off, I'm generating more income uh, now today than I um, ever have in the shop. And I just, um, I give all the thanks and all the glory to yes. God. And um, I know that um, uh, staying the course and being faithful and being obedient with the uh, tithe, even when it seemed like it was hard to do, we we remained faithful and we, we did that, took that right off of the top. So I hope this encourages um, our family, you at Catalyst Church. Yes, in fact, mm -hmm. um, our prayer is for this little small piece of our overall story to encourage and bless you, to help you lean in and get everything that Jesus has for you. Mm -hmm. We love you and we look forward to seeing you really soon. Mm -hmm. Blessings. Blessings. Well, good morning, Catalyst Church. So glad to see you. Thank you for joining us today. If you're a guest, we are especially glad to have you with us. Take a moment, reach out to us. Our Connections team would love to help you become a part of the Catalyst Church family. Thank you for joining us. You honor us. So how many of you, maybe you caught this in the news, but two weeks ago, a federal judge in Seattle tossed out a lawsuit that was brought against the city of Seattle by the estate of a 16-year-old boy who was shot and killed during the Chaz Chop incident in 2020. Maybe you recall the Chaz riots in Seattle, you know, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, as it was self-styled. And allegedly, uh, the, you know, celebrated by Mayor Durkin, even kind of surprisingly, but it was a six city block, six city block area of the Capitol Hill neighborhood in Seattle, taken over by protesters and anarchists. And during one of the nightly melees, I guess, a 16-year-old boy was shot and killed. Well, it turns out that he and another teen had stolen a vehicle for a joyride, you know, they, you know, and they, you know, they got scared, and they drove it to Chaz, believing that the anarchists there would welcome them as you know, fellow lawless hooligans. Instead, they rammed the vehicle into a barricade, you know, and the self-appointed Chaz police shot both of them on the spot. So, of course, the boy's family sued the city of Seattle for negligence. Let's be sure we follow the logic. Two teenagers steal a car, take it on a joyride, decide to flee to the supposedly sovereign nation of Chaz, who presumably can't even spell extrad extradition, let alone do they have you know, formal diplomatic ties with the United States of America. <laughs> Their intent is to be granted, I don't know what, diplomatic immunity? You know, asylum refugee status? But instead, they're shot at the border checkpoint by the Chaz militia of vigilantes. And one of them, unfortunately, dies at the scene. And his family wants the local government, which had been forcibly exiled from the area, held accountable. What I find somewhat amazing in this whole thing is not that the suit was filed. Truly, that's not surprising that people would think they have a legitimate suit there. But that the suit was actually thrown out as ridiculous. Finally, there's some semblance of common sense. Why do I share this ridiculous but tragic story? It's to illustrate that really it is often within our whacked out makeup to turn our backs on what has been offered to us in our attempts to write our own rules, 
you know, to be our own boss. The so-called pioneers and citizens of Chaz believed that the only way to fix the problems in America was to forcibly create their own autonomous zone. Well, autonomous, at least until someone realized that 100% of their utilities came from outside their borders and the utility companies shut off their supply. I mean, you want to deny the blessings of being citizens? Okay, knock yourselves out. The real reason I share this is that too many Christ followers deny the blessings that are available in their lives by trying to write their own rules and do their own thing. Turning their back on God's promised blessings of more. Nowhere does this show up more readily and quickly than in the area of finances. Today we're going to be looking at a couple different passages in our more series. One from the Old Testament that shows three truths about God, and the other is a New Testament passage that shows us three truths about blessing. But before we continue, let me reiterate a couple things that I, you know, from last week as we started this more series. One, it's never about money. God doesn't need our money. Our attitude about money is more important than our abilities. This is what we learned last week. Our attitude is more important than our abilities, more important than our position, and more important than our resources. And second, we saw that giving aligns our attitude with God's heart. And it does so through obedience. You know, head knowledge alone just doesn't cut it. We have to put it into obedient action. And I hope I wasn't too bullish last week, but I'm not really going to back off on declaring God's promises, especially when it comes to something as important and universally applicable as his promises for more in our finances. Remember this, God's financial blessings are conditional upon our actions. We shouldn't be at all surprised God approaches money that way, how he directs our financial lives, how he provides, how he favors, how he blesses. All of those are reflections of his nature. So if you look through scripture, you will see that God is quite often generous beyond reason. We see from his example that, you know, like him, we are to share from our resources, our possessions, our wealth. Generous giving is part and parcel of genuine Christ followership. So turn with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Chronicles. We're going to be in chapter 29, and let's pick it up at verse 10. It says here, Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and earth and on earth is yours. O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. O our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. We are here for only a moment, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon without a trace. O Lord our God, even this material we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name comes from you. It all belongs to you. We're going to find three truths about our giving God in this passage. The first is this, that God's power to bless. His power to bless. He has an ability to give. Now, that might just seem really simplistic, but at some point, I think we need to just acknowledge he is powerful to give. Verse 10 there, 
you know, O Lord, the God of our ancestors, may you be praised and forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in heavens, in the heavens and on earth is yours. When we assess what we have, it often makes us hesitate in, in giving. I don't have enough. Or if I give, I'll run out. King David declares this truth about God. Nothing holds you back, Lord. Your power, your majesty, your victory. God's own ability to give defies all limitations. Where we see limitations in what we can do, what we could give, God has no limitations. That's the first truth we see. His power is there to bless. A couple of weeks ago, I made the, the, the point you know, that something is always better than nothing, that what we give you know, in sincerity and authenticity can be used by the Holy Spirit to enact solutions and transformation. No matter how big the need, and I declared that you know, what we do give will always amount to more than what we could give. You know, there's a hidden biblical pattern in this principle of God's powerful presence. In the Old Testament, we see time and again that God does things, powerful things. He alters the course of, of individuals and nations and even mankind through his actions. He's God. He gets to do that. But from the advent of Jesus forward, something shifts and changes in how God moves. From Jesus onward, God never just does anything. He always does it through an obedient person. Before the voice of God spoke or the hand of God moved, but from Jesus onward, and that means into us, into our time, God still moves, but he doesn't just do things. He now moves through people, through a person, through an obedient person. God's power is there to bless. The second truth we see in this passage is that God's provision of blessing, his willingness to give is what we see. Look there in verse 12. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. God chooses to give. And he gives at his discretion. Here's a sobering thought. You and I have everything we need right now to fulfill God's plan for our lives in this moment. If we need more, it's ready and it's waiting. If we are truly lacking, then the fault lies with either our readiness or our obedience, not with God's provision. And notice what I said. If we are truly lacking, so often we think we are missing something because it's what we want. If we need something, there it is. God will always provide as we need. In fact, we see that principle in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Keep your thumb in, in Chronicles there, and let's turn with me to the, to the prophet, prophet Malachi. Chapter 3, verse 10. God's, Malachi says this, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. We, you know, we find ourselves thinking, where's this abundant blessing such that I cannot contain it? I think here's the, here's the problem. So often, most people are expecting God to pour out this blessings upon them as he has promised so they stand there with a shot glass of obedience that makes no sense lord you've promised to pour out these blessings such that i cannot contain it so i will obey you with this tiny little shot glass of obedience if you want ridiculous blessings Try this, ridiculous obedience. So often, in fact, I will probably, I'll go on a limb and say always, the limitation isn't God. The limitation is you and I. We have limits to how much of his blessing we are willing to obey into. 
God's willingness to give is evident. His ability to give is evident. It's our willingness to obey his rules. Sometimes we need to call that into question. You and I have what we want. You and I have what we need. When our trust and faith and obedience prove that more is necessary, more will be there. Which leads into really the third truth from this passage, and that's God's partnership in blessing. We've seen his power, his provision. Now we're going to see his partnership in blessing, his reason to give. Look at verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. We are here for only a moment, visitors, strangers in the land, as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon without a trace. You know, giving involves partnership. We're taking part in the dream that God is working out. He's working it out in our lives. He's working it out in the other's lives. You've heard the cliche before, we make a living by what we receive, but we make a life by what we give. You know, right now, I would say a younger generation of, of Americans is hearing about and, and learning about a, a lesson which will have horrific fruit in the decades to come, especially if it's not uprooted and corrected. It's really this, the government is your source. I'm going to climb up on a soapbox right now, probably. And, but you know what? Freedoms and liberties are not granted by the government. Economic prosperity is not the responsibility of the president or of the government. Individual health is not the purview of the government. In fact, I would say, you know, the one and probably the only thing that the socialists have right and correct is this. Every thing is a partnership. No one makes it alone. Okay, maybe they got that one piece right. They're wrong on everything else. We do, in fact, need one another. That's how God designed us, for community. He's also invited you and I into a partnership with him. His blessings of more in our life depend upon him and upon ourselves. Did you catch that? His blessings of more in our life depend upon him and upon ourselves. His power and provision in partnership with our obedience. There's a challenge here, boy, in this passage in, in 1 Chronicles 29. A challenge to leaders. Look at verse 17. I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. You know I have done all this with good motives and I've watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyously. Leaders need to lead by example. Verse 18 has a challenge to parents. O oh Lord, the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make your people always want to obey you. See to it that their love for you never changes. Give my son Solomon the wholehearted desire to obey all your commands, laws, and decrees, and to do everything necessary to build this temple for which I have made these preparations. There's legacy there. There's an example of legacy and carrying it on through generations. We've looked at three truths about our giving God, our blessing God. Let's look at three truths about blessing itself. Turn with me in the New Testament to Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25, a familiar chapter, we've been there before. In fact, we've been there very recently. I know we just looked at this passage a couple weeks ago, but I really felt like I wanted to return to it in this topic of more. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand, the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, 
When did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. We are accountable for what we do with God's blessings. That's the first truth that this passage teaches us. We are accountable for what we do with God's blessing. That's an unmistakable feature of Jesus' teaching right here. There are expectations on what we do with what we have. That really shouldn't surprise us. Why would God pour out his blessings on us if we're going to behave opposite of his nature? If while we have those resources, those treasures, if you will, and we behave the opposite of his nature, why would he bless that? Why would he reward that? Why would he invest into that? Interesting, you know, verse 29, if you go back up just a few, a little bit in this passage in Matthew 25, verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. I challenge every one of us, look at that verse 29, use it as a, a filter, a set of lenses, and now look at your own behavior with the resources God has entrusted to you. Have you used them well? Have you used them for the purpose they were given? Can you anticipate an abundance according to his standard? The second truth we learn here is that using our resources to meet others' needs is equivalent to giving to God himself. He says, you did these things to others as if you were doing them to me. Proverbs chapter 19, keep your thumb there in Matthew. Proverbs 19 has an interesting promise. Verse 17 says this, very simple, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will repay you. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will repay you. Stop and think slowly through this one. God views our sacrificial meeting of the needs of others as a debt that we hold over him. Wow. Maybe this is the intersection where tithes and offerings diverge. Tithes, you know, if you're not familiar, but tithes you know, are really the, the bare minimum of financial obedience. You know, they're to be given you know, to the, the local church for the purpose of supporting the ministry. That first 10% of our increase, of our income. Offerings are anything above and beyond that 10% usually given to specific needs or specific opportunities for blessing. And I'm not sure that tithes would fall into this indebtedness category, but I'm fairly confident that offerings above and beyond the tithe would. If I'm reading this passage in Proverbs correctly, I, I, I believe that God sees himself as indebted to us when we give generously and sacrificially. The third truth we see in this passage in Matthew carries on. Verse 41, Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous will go into eternal life. The third truth we see in this passage is that withholding our resources from others' needs is equivalent to withholding from God himself. 
come on, we each can we each can generate a myriad of beautifully crafted, legitimate sounding excuses as to why we should not give. Why generosity is not the right response. God will have none of it. Jesus' words are clear and unmistakable to those who withhold in the face of need. Away with you, cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. That's not what I want to hear. And if the difference is in how I handle the resources that God has entrusted to me, by choosing to give obediently and generously, then I'm going to go that way, and I'm going to go with the, you know, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. I'd much rather hear that, wouldn't you? And these are sober truths. They're not guilt trips. You know, if you hear anything I say and it induces guilt, then I have misspoken. I've gotten in the way of the message. But if you hear what I declare and it strikes a a gnawing feeling in you, then that isn't guilt. That's the Holy Spirit's conviction. You and I, all of us, we need to grasp once and for all, blessings aren't simply the expansion of our wallets and bank accounts. Blessings are God's instrument for expanding his kingdom. He blesses his obedient servants for more. More lives reached, more stories of transformation, more resources reaching, more needs. The love, the grace, and the mercy of Christ. I'm so thankful the Lord has granted to us generous provision. Lord, I thank you for granting generous provision in my life. It opens the door to partner. It opens the door to be a part of the dreams of others' lives. I thank you that God has made you and I a channel for his blessings. As we close our time today, I'd like to pray that you would be open to God's blessings, which may mean breaking through some disobedience areas in our life. His desire is to move his resources through your obedience. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for calling us into the partnership. Father, forgive us for our disobedience. Forgive us for not reflecting your heart of generosity. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your conviction that leads us into repentance, leads us to a new path, a path that walks us into the blessings of abundance, the blessings of more. So Lord, as we obey you in this area, we obey you in the tithes and the offerings, we take you at your word and we trust you. According to your promise, we can anticipate that you will pour out your blessings upon our lives, and in our finances as we open up our cup of obedience to you. We declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On behalf of Catalyst Church, I want to thank you for your generosity. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you for the I want to thank God for the blessings that are coming your way in Jesus' name. Have a great week. We'll see you next week as we look at the conditions of blessing. Amen.